he has an FRCS from Royal College of Surgeons Ireland and an FRCS from Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Glasgow UK and he is also an MCH in Ortho. So uh, Dr. Blonde has experience in uh, in several national uh, conferences. Uh, he has received a best paper award for uh, a, uh, a speaker program in the Japanese Orthopedic Society for Knee Arthroscopy and Sports Medicine. He has received a travel grant and he has also received a best poster award in the 2018 ISHKS, that is Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons in knee replacement category. So doctor has a, 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 a wide a practice in the UK uh, for almost uh, many years uh, from 1996 uh, to 2001. He has practiced in several uh, hospitals in the United Kingdom. And uh, he is uh, uh, also a, a very experienced uh, uh, person. He has uh, many research papers uh, to his credit in uh, many uh, national journals. And he's also he has also been a faculty in a lot of national conferences. Uh, so we thank you, Doctor, for accepting our invitation and being with uh, being here with us. And uh, we uh, look forward to hear from you on this topic and gain insights. Over to you, Doctor Sanjay. Yeah, thanks, Grace, for this um, very flowery introduction. Uh, we'll start with our um, today's main topic. Is it visible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's visible. Yes. Hello. Yes, it's visible. Yeah. So I think, uh, as you are aware, uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we are always used to be more in the theater, and uh, this COVID pandemic has actually uh, changed the way we have practiced. And uh, as you are aware, this is the first pandemic which is uh, sort of faced by our generation. We never had the uh, the vocabulary of words like lockdowns and restrictions and, uh, you know, level two protection, level three protection. But I think uh, as the world is evolving uh, and as India is now facing the COVID pandemic, as an orthopedic surgeon, we are faced with a lot of challenges. And... Uh, I think um, when Sanofi approached me for a topic, I thought it is better that we talk about the protocol for operating emergency trauma cases or operating orthopedic cases in COVID pandemic. Now, uh, uh, let me let me just uh, tell you that I have almost uh, reviewed almost 19 articles uh, for this particular topic because I wrote a review of this particular topic for some prestigious journal. So I think... Um, yeah, all these studies are about level three, level four, and level five evidences because, uh, as you are aware, there is there are all retrospective cohort studies. They are not prospective randomized clinical control trials because the world is facing this pandemic for the first time, and obviously there is no control, and uh, people are just learning from each other's experiences, and uh, the protocols are evolving. Uh, let me just tell you at the beginning only, nothing is dogmatic. I think every day we are learning something new and that's why we need to be very dynamic and we need to be very fluid in our approach to the pandemic. So I think going directly to our topic, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you are aware, uh, there are some papers um, or there are some recommendations for the elective orthopedic surgery. But to the best of my knowledge in the western part of India, and I think even I was just discussing to, with Dr. Saha in the, to the, in the beginning of this uh, just before starting this webinar, even in the eastern part of the India, people are not still embarking upon the elective surgery. Though there is a very good paper by Jabad Parvezi in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, American volume from Rothman Institute. And the, that sort of talks about the how to resume the elective surgery. But as you are aware, I think we are almost at least two or three months away from starting our elective surgery. So let's discuss and concentrate on how we approach our emergency trauma practice during this COVID pandemic. Now, these are the very good papers which I have come across. So I have just, um, uh, I believe the Sanofi can share these papers with the participants also if they want. There is one paper from Harshman, there is another paper from Rodriguez Pinto, another paper from Award and Corcolini. Corcolini is from Italy. All the papers are basically level four and level five evidences. 
and they basically talk about how one should approach the trauma patients during this covid pandemic in their emergency practice in their operating room how this patient should be managed in the wards and how basically after the discharge what the protocol should be so i think when i prepared this slide uh, uh, as of uh, i think 10th of june uh, almost in india there were about 21000 deaths now as you know the uh, yesterday only we had about uh, near 700 deaths and 45000 infections so i think every day the, the the count is rising and the corona is according to me is going to be there with us for at least till end of the december and we need to adjust and adapt our practice and protect ourselves protect our paramedical staff the theater staff and far and for most importantly our patients and their relations so i think uh, this is very primitive but i thought it is for the completion i should always mention this the modes of transmission of corona virus is predominantly via droplet aerosol but direct contamination of the surface and fomite transfer is also there so any personal prophylaxis needs to consider both these modes and one needs to consider the viral load to which the healthcare worker is exposed which in turn influences the severity of disease so aerosol spread is spread from the infected patient to the healthcare worker via direct aerosol assault while sneezing or coughing or whatever and the quantum of viral load is also very important means people have quantified the level of contamination from encounters such as talking to high level contamination like sneezing and coughing such aerosol entry may why why am i might be through the nose through the mouth or the eyelids and distance of the source to the recipient is also very important and that that's why the concept the very concept of safe distance or social distancing of 6 feet has come in now since the virus can enter through our eyes also so, so that in that's why in addition to our n95 mask we are using the 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 face protection or the visors or something like that now very interestingly the size of the corona virus is about 100 nanometers and that's why simple hence the simple mathematics will always sort of question how a n95 mask which can only filter 300 nanometers uh, nanometer particle challenge how it can filter the corona virus but as you know uh, the corona virus movement is not like a linear motion it is always a zigzag movement like a brownian brownian motion from physics and that's why n95 mask is capable of at least blocking 95% of the assault of this particular virus there are certain mask which we will see afterwards they are called n99 mask which are capable of filtering almost 99% of these viral particles so aerosol or droplet contamination by the eye is also there and it can be um, we usually now use either the glasses like a hiv kit or the visors or a face shield in addition to our n95 mask now direct contamination from the fomites uh, i think you must be aware that cdc guideline is there that surface to transfer surface transfer is rare but still it can happen and if there is a patient if there is a zone of a high viral load then definitely one needs to be very careful so direct contact with the contaminated surfaces may also lead to inoculation for example when a healthcare worker examines the patient in our opd or in the wards and then uses the contaminated hand to rub one's eye or the face so this should be completely avoided and as you can see, as you are aware the, the sars virus can stay on the copper for about 4 hours can stay on cardboards or our notes for about 24 hours and can stay for almost 3 days on the plastic and stainless steel our ot instruments hence frequent hand washing is extremely important either with soap uh, soap or with alcoholic uh, disinfecting gel and direct decontamination of all patient contact points like uh, the chairs or the doors or the examination couch which you use for our patients they need to be clear cleaned uh, very repeatedly and preferably even after every patient after the opd consultation so emergency pre operative plan uh, i think uh, Uh, i will discuss the the experience which have been gathered all across the globe especially from wuhan the paper there is a fantastic paper from wuhan in knee surgery sports traumatology and arthroscopy and there is another paper in jbjs british by uh, italian authors which share their milan metropolitan area experience and these two papers are very very good because they give a good picture of how one should handle these sort of emergency trauma cases so according to the patient's condition trauma injury type stability of the patient and purpose of operation should be completed as far as possible in a single stage minimal multiple operation should be avoided 
minimally invasive techniques should be uh, employed and disposable surgical instruments should be used wherever possible and non operative treatment should be strongly considered especially you know the fracture upper neck of humerus or um, undisplaced tibial condyle fractures or undisplaced distal radius fractures can be easily conserved during this pandemic times so patient transfer to the operating room as the patient has covid 19 testing is difficult to get quickly fortunately now in india uh, i think the things are changing and uh, uh, there were some sort of hiccups in between because every day some new directive was coming but at least in mumbai now we can easily test the covid uh, for the uh, covid uh, test the patients for the covid and the report also comes within say about 24 hours so basically in covid pandemic irrespective of whether there is a high contact sort of encounter or not all medical personnel should take at least level 2 protective measures using the special transfer vehicle with disposable sheets to transfer the patient from the ambulance to the negative pressure operation room and through a special channel and a special lift ideally the lift should be dedicated only to the covid patients and it should be clearly marked on the on the door of the lift that this is for the covid patients so i think we'll just roughly touch base upon certain nomenclature for filtering face pieces as you can see it is called as ffp1 or p1 ffp2 or p2 or ffp3 uh, uh, the number the level percentage of filtration with p1 is 80% the percentage of filtration with p2 is 94% and percentage of filtration with p3 is about 99% if you come to the american nomenclature it is more or less the same but then, uh, uh, this is more widely used all across the globe n95 filters almost 95% of the 300 nanometer particles n99 filters 99% of the particles whereas n100 filters 99.97% of the particles level of pp is available i think uh, uh, when i mentioned all the healthcare workers should be using level 2 at all encounters with the patients and level 3 especially in the operating room or in a covid uh, dedicated ward so level 1 protection is basically disposable surgical cap disposable surgical mask work uniform disposable gloves and isolation clothing for the level 2 is all of these but in addition the n95 mask is uh, is mandatory there should be a work uniform our scrubs then there is a medical medical protective uniform preferably a ppe kit and there should be eye protection in the form of visors or goggles level 3 protection all of this but instead of n95 it is better to use powered air purifying respirator that is called as paper or full face respiratory protective devices now i think as you are aware all the hospitals may not be in a economical condition to buy these and that's why i think the majority of the uh, hospitals and majority of the healthcare physicians all across the globe because of the limited quantity of paper i think n95 masks are routinely used in and in with addition uh, a full face uh, basically a protection in the form of uh, eye shield or something is deployed so i think screening item for all patients admitted during the covid pandemic i think all patients should be considered positive unless proved otherwise there are certain test uh, i think number one is a antibody test but again there is a lot of controversy about it the second one is a ct of the chest very very important and very good method of quick screening of the patient for covid and a nucleic acid test or rna test which used to take almost 48 hours in mumbai before but now fortunately we can procure the test in about 24 hours now as far as our uh, part of the world is concerned or part of the uh, uh, country is concerned i think majority of the hospitals uh, we are screening the patients for uh, uh, for uh, uh, covid test as well as a ct of the chest before taking them for any sort of surgery i'll i'll share some of my experiences uh, uh, and whatever trauma cases which i operated during this pandemic uh, at a later time so i think uh, for the orthopedic uh, surgeons it is extremely important for us to know if the patient is covid positive and comes with a fracture neck of femur or some acute emergency what are the stages of covid you know uh, what is meant by mild covid what is meant by moderate covid severe covid and critical covid so mild covid is symptoms are mild no pneumonia on the imaging and uh, as you are aware no contra uh, so indication for emergency surgery there is no contraindication from the covid point of view 
and as you are aware these patients are actually treated at home now see these papers are uh, some of the papers are from wuhan and some of the papers from are from italy and there they used to operate on even covid positive patients now i have discussed with dr saha i have discussed with some other colleagues uh, in, in some other webinar and to the best of my knowledge i think in india at least in mumbai and other parts of maharashtra people are not operating on the covid positive patients actually we are waiting for almost 10 to 12 days then we are repeating the two covid tests at a interval of 48 hours because as you are aware the covid test can be false negative in 38 to 32% of patients and that's why if you repeat two tests and if both tests come negative then that false negativity comes down to almost 5 to 6% statistically and if you combine that with a ct scan which is covid which shows covid negativity then probably you are more safe or you can say with certainty that the patient doesn't have covid infection and then we are taking up the patients for operation but uh, mild covid is uh, in italy and in uh, china they have operated on covid positive patients as well so moderate covid patient is a patient which has some respiratory symptoms and fever and pneumonitis mani uh, manifestations on uh, ct but they don't require oxygen severe covid is the patient whose respiratory rate is more than 30 his spo2 is less than 93% and he requires a positive uh, uh, basically a oxygen su uh, uh, support and on the ct there are uh, patients uh, these patients have more than 50% of the lesion progression in the 24 to 48 hours critical covid obviously these patients are in the respiratory failure and they are on ventilator so i think even one is heroic enough to operate on or if there is a life saving or a limb saving emergency and if the patient is covid positive then if the patient has mild or moderate symptoms from the covid then there is no contraindication from the covid point of view for the emergency surgery but if the patient is critical then obviously there is absolute contraindication or if the patient is severe according to the grading of covid from the lung point of view then also it is a relative contraindication <coughs> for emergency sir now uh, what pp i think uh, all the surgeons or all the um, or uh, healthcare providers are interested in uh, in knowing what pp should be worn what steps should be done what and by healthcare workers in different areas of patient pathway so i have sort of summarized it uh, uh, this is again uh, i have taken it from uh, compiled it from the paper from wuhan so on site first aid one should be using level 2 because all the body fluids of the covid positive patients they contain covid virus be it a vomitus urine blood sputum so in when in pandemic all patients are suspected of having covid ambulance one should be taking level 2 precaution emergency room level 2 precaution that is n95 mask uh, patient transfer to the hospital again level 2 precaution you know as we come to uh, operating room uh, i think uh, before the patient is shifted from the hospital from the ward to the theater obviously a covid 19 scan should be taken as early as possible because there the result is instantaneous your radiology colleague can tell you whether the patient has covid pneumonitis or not and because the covid covid test still takes almost about uh, 18 to 24 hours in the operating room uh, we will we will discuss that in detail but specific advice and important knowledge is level 3 precaution should be taken as uh, i have told you before a severe covid is a relative contraindication and a critical covid is a absolute contraindication for any emergency surgery all the operating room uh, personnel should be wearing level 3 uh, masks if not level 2 but that is sub optimal supported by visors or goggles then the specific uh, theater should be labeled with covid 19 big sign minimum staff member should be there ideally a convert the ot from a positive pressure ventilation it should be co uh, converted to a negative pressure of minus 5 pascals all patients should have the masks if awake and exhaust filters if under anesthesia remove the spoke from the electrocautery quickly as far as possible decrease the use of electrocautery because electrocautery also generates aerosol and which can be infectious Uh, we are very fond of using pulse lavage as a orthopedic surgeon but i think we need to be extremely cautious and judicious in using pulse lavage and reducing the irrigation and obviously we should obviously negate or minimize the splashing of the fluid as well as the patient's body fluid uh, uh, at the end of the operation i think all the doffing should be means all the pp should be removed in the same operation theater 
in the buffer room the surgeon should properly disinfect the hands and the feet and then he should come to the surgical chamber isolation wards general wards one should be taking level 2 precautions uh, because in the isolation wards also there might be certain uh, procedures like intubation or rails tube insertion or um, putting a catheter uh, in the general ward post operatively if the patient is developing infection Uh, don't suspect of surgical wound infection, but always suspect that a COVID negative patient might have contacted the COVID within the hospital, and he might have developed the COVID. And that's why frequent monitoring of the body temperature as well as respiratory symptoms and SpO2 is absolutely mandatory. In the outpatient, I think one should be taking level two precautions. I think all of us are doing that as far as possible. Tele consultation should be encouraged. Uh, minimum hospital visit should be there. and at the end of every consultation i think the operating uh, the assisting nurse or a, uh, your uh, uh, ward boy should be cleaning the table with sodium hypochlorite or virex solution and as far as possible one should avoid sort of touching the articles which the patients have brought and in our practice we don't allow the patients relations to come in we only allow the patients and that to after screening on first on tele consultation so i think uh, this is the sort of protocol which the people in uh, milan that is in italy they had developed the orthopedic surgeons they classified the patients according to the color code so the red color code was uh, basically uh, immediate time, immediate uh, surgery was needed like hemodynamically unstable pelvic ring fractures long bone fractures with associated vascular lesions there you cannot wait so preferably type 3 uh, level 3 precaution in the theater and the patient needs to be treated as a covid patient unless proved otherwise orange color is one can wait up to 1 to 6 hours these are the patients with uh, traumatic amputations or compartment syndromes or uh, open fractures uh, green sort of surgical patients are those can be operated within 6 to 24 hours fortunately now we have ct scan which will give the status immediately and added by another covid test which usually now the result comes in 24 hours so these patients are green patients these are the patients which are hemodynamically stable they are mechanically uh, hemodynamically stable but mechanically unstable pelvic fracture can wait 2 to 6 to 24 hours if the patient is stable certain dislocations unstable dislocations of the knee and ankle joint then uh, pediatric proximal humeral fractures with vascular compromise that is uh, your suprachondylar fracture can be waited for about 6 hours unless there is a uh, arterial cut or something what you are expecting uh, if young patients with femoral fractures i had one patient in may where we did all the covid and everything and operated that patient within 24 hours because of the the more you wait as you are aware i think all of us are aware that uh, the complication rate of avn and arthritis increases femoral and tibial diaphyseal fractures i think nowadays there they, they can be managed pretty easily because now the covid test is coming within 24 hours and certain patients who need to be operated within 48 hours but they can be waited more than 24 hours those are white patients which are deep wounds with tendon injuries femoral neck fractures with elderly because obviously these patients they will require a workup like uh, uh, 2d echo and electrolytes and everything and physician fitness so this is a very again a very uh, important slide uh, from the paper from the group or the uh, the, the dedicated trauma hospital uh, which was there to handle all the trauma patients in the milan metropolitan area so again i think now we will deal with these uh, sort of things in slightly detail pp in the operating room as I, as i have told you before the door of the operating room should be marked with covid 19 sign staff members should be minimized in the operating room visitors to the operating room should be restricted and medical personnel should not enter or leave the operating room unless the theater is the, the theater is finished or the surgical surgery is finished because it will disrupt the um, uh, negative pressure all the uh, operating uh, sort of room staff or uh, uh, excepting the circulating nurse should be wearing level 3 pp the running nurses or the circulating nurse can wear a level 2 or what typically what we call them a circulating nurse she can wear it level 2 pp there always should be buffer room between the scrubbing room and the main operating room the buffer room should be closed and equipment should be minimized in the operating room staff wearing the pp in the operating room are forbidden to leave the operating room until all the pp is removed at the end of the operation and the operation is finished 
Again, this is very important. Patient without general anesthesia, patients who receive a spinal or epidural anesthesia should wear N95 surgical mask throughout the operation. And for patients who are having general anesthesia, a breathing filter should be installed between the anesthetic mask and the respiratory loop, that is the anesthesia circuit. And a breathing filter should be installed at the inhalation as well as the exhalation room, exhalation end of that anesthesia circuit. This is very, very important because then uh, if the patient is inadvertently positive, the machine itself can be a carrier and can pass on the infection to the other patient. Operating room, I think all nowadays, fortunately, all the good orthopedic hospitals and the theaters have uh, HEPA filters. They are extremely useful and they, they are a must in the, in, the, in the times of COVID. And the operating room should preferably have a minus 5 Pascal negative pressure. Again, that goes without saying that after surgery, the room should be disinfected by spraying parasitic acid or hydrogen peroxide foaming for more than two hours. And the laminar airflow obviously should be off at that particular, when you are fumigating that particular room. Then frequent sampling of the surfaces and the air in the operation room should be tested by the hospital infection control team and the microbiologist. And once they give that all clear, then only the disinfection process stops and the second patient might be taken in that particular theater. Now, uh, I work in one of the hospitals uh, at Holy Spirit Hospital in Mumbai, which is a COVID hospital. It's almost a 350-bedded hospital. So there we are restricting the number of cases which we are doing to two a day because I don't think it is physically possible and it will. it is very uh, physically as well as emotionally taxing on all the healthcare workers as well as the paramedical staff to maintain all this uh, discipline. So we are restricting uh, at least only one case a day or a couple of cases a day, not more than that. Prevention of surgical aerosol, extremely important. These papers, especially Hiroshima's paper, it shows that surgery using electrocautery, ultrasonic bone knife, drill, pulsatile lavage, and other power equipment, they result in aerosolization of the blood, bone, and tissue fluid. And as you're aware, COVID-19 is present in all the body fluids. So basically it will be present in the aerosol as well. So till to date, there is no documented case of actually uh, aerosol leading to the infection of an orthopedic surgeon, but this is highly likely. And it is very, I think it is, it's a common sense that one should be using, one should be limiting the use of these particular instruments as well as the pulsatile lavage. Now the smoke generated, should be removed by the aspirator, not the suction, because the, when you use a suction, that also generates the aerosol. So as far as possible, minimize the use of electrocautery, minimize the use of pulse lavage, minimize the use of normal saline for flushing. And obviously, one should be wearing the HIV kit and a, it's like a goggles or a, a visor or a face shield. Uh, the surgical team needs to cooperate closely to prevent smoke from the electrocautery, splashing of the patient's body fluid, and obviously sharp instrument injury during the operation time. Disinfection of the surgical instruments, the international guidelines are surgical instruments that have been directly exposed to the patient's body fluid should be immediately scrubbed with 1000 to 2000 milligrams per liter chlorine containing preparation that is sodium hypochlorite and then placed into a double layer yellow medical waste bag labeled with clear cut COVID and immediately inform the CSST or the disinfection team and the supply center to take them away. Post-operative management, uh, after the operation, as I've told you, I think all the staff nurse and all the staff, including the surgeon, should need to remove the PP in the theater, go to the buffer room, clean themselves with a soap water solution or uh, uh, alcohol-containing solution, and then only exit to a dedicated exit gate. Medical staff are as well advised to take appropriate protective measures according to the patients with or without COVID and the environment which they are exposed in their work. Obviously, I think that's nowadays a must preoperative CT scan is important investigation for clinical diagnosis of COVID. If you combine that with nucleic acid testing, then the chances of false negativity becomes very, very less. And after the operation, the body temperature of the patient as well as the SpO2 should be frequently monitored because we have had certain patients, I'll share the experience, who were COVID negative. And I think after coming to the hospital after about four or five days, their, their CT showed COVID pneumonitis as well as they, they developed a, a positive COVID test. So patients' blood uh, temperature as well as the SpO2 should be monitored frequently at least three times a day after the operation in the wards. The, the number of days uh, uh, the patient stays in the ward should be completely minimized. The patient should not be kept in the hospital unnecessarily. 
and early discharge should be facilitated for the betterment of the patient as well as the healthcare workers. Discharge and post-discharge management for patients without COVID should be scheduled as early as possible to reduce cross-infection in the hospital. And again, after being discharged from the hospital, as far as possible, online consultation should be encouraged or telemedicine should be encouraged to guide the patients for the further follow-up treatment. So I think I'll share a couple of my cases uh, which I had operated. Uh, we had one fracture neck femur patient who was HBSAG positive. Uh, when she came to the accident and emergency department, she had a very bad ECG and her BP was almost 80 by 60. So she underwent the angiography, then she underwent a bypass and till that time she was COVID negative. She was kept in the CCU and maybe after about seven, eight days, once she came out of the bypass and the physicians thought that it's, and the cardiologist thought that it is safe for us to go and fix the neck femur fracture, we repeated her COVID test as well as the CT, which came as positive. So the patient was kept in the hospital because we cannot send the patient with fracture neck of femur. So our general protocol here, as I have mentioned before, is we do two COVID tests at the interval of about 42 to 72 hours, 48 to 72 hours. So that if two tests become negative, then as I have told you, the false negativity rate, uh, which is for a single test, which is about 32 to 38%, it falls down to almost minus five to, uh, falls down to about five to 6%. And if you combine that with the CT of the chest, which is, if it is negative, then you are reasonably assured and safe to go ahead with the COVID, uh, uh, go ahead in the, with a very safe mind and a fresh mind uh, thinking that the patient is COVID negative. Because as you are aware, it is not just you catching the infection, but if you operate a COVID positive patient, there are multiple papers which show that the morbidity as well as the mortality in these particular COVID positive patients is, is significantly high as compared to the patients who have, who are COVID negative. Then there is another patient who actually uh, had a fracture tibia. He was, his CT was negative. Uh, which is actually vice versa, you know, but his COVID test came positive. So we were a little surprised. So we did the COVID test from some other laboratory, another reputed laboratory, and that test was also positive. So basically, obviously, we informed the BMC. Uh, since he was asymptomatic, the BMC, Bombay Municipal Corporation, basically isolated him in the home quarantine and home treatment. Again, at the end of 12 days, we repeated the test. Another 14, at the end of 14 days, after two days, we repeated the test. Both the tests were negative, so the patient <clears> was <throat> taken to the, uh, to, the, to the operation theater and we did the tibia nailing. So I think these are the sort of emerging sort of uh, consensus which are coming in the, in the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, uh, as you are aware, uh, in Mumbai and Maharashtra was uh, always topping the list. And since I practice in Villeparle and Andheri and the area was very close to the airport, we were the first one to be hit with the COVID-19 pandemic. But fortunately for us, since again, it's not a part of this topic, but I think the severity of the infection is coming down because a lot, couple of my very good radiology colleagues, they told me about three, four days back, the in the day, suppose in the month of April or May, if they were seeing about uh, two or three very bad COVID lungs every day, the same radiologists are telling us that now they are seeing only two or three bad COVID lungs per week. So probably the patients are becoming infected, but the severity of the infection is coming down. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously we are taking vitamin D, vitamin B12, vitamin C. Personally, I have taken hydroxychloroquine also every week. Again, there is a lot of controversy. But I think uh, I can proudly say that um, though three of our uh, sort of junior doctors at the hospital, they tested positive. But it was a mild symptom because they were doing a continuous heads off to them. They were doing continuous, uh, not a uh, orthopedic duty, but continuous accident and emergency duty. Uh, they had contacted the COVID, but it was a mild COVID and fortunately all of them recovered. So I think that is the sort of uh, uh, emerging consensus about the orthopedic surgeries in COVID. As I have told you, there is a very good paper by Javed Pravesi about the elective orthopedics in COVID which is a sort of a, a, a expert opinion and a consensus, which is there in JBJS American. But I think uh, to the best of my knowledge, no orthopedic surgeon has embarked as we speak today on the elective surgery. And I feel, I think we are away from that for at least two or three months, you know, 
so by that time some more research will come maybe some good new drugs will come and hopefully a vaccine will also come so i think i hand over to dr saha uh, uh, do you have any questions or any participant has any questions yes oh that presentation was uh, very lucid and very elaborate and i think you've touched every point of the surgical interventions and how we should protect ourselves uh, before am i audible yes yes, uh, yes. yeah uh, before we go ahead i would like to impress on two specific papers and what we learn from them number one is the wuhan paper which came in april now it was a questionnaire to self questionnaire to 25 orthopedic surgeons from eight hospitals now they were going to the wards they were doing the theaters they were doing uh, seeing patients in the icu and they were also doing their clinics it was found that about 70 more than 70% of the exposure came from the general ward and 12% from the theater these doctors when they went back home did they transmit it to their friends or colleagues or family members it was found that in 25% of the patient doctors they gave about 20% infection to the family members and the most important finding from this paper was the most important risk factor was a generalized severe fatigability this was these are the three inferences from this paper and another paper which came out from jaydevan in india this is so very important for all of us to know 100 and more than 110 doctors died due to covid pandemic in india what we thought it is an elderly population which is getting affected but actually from the statistics from maharashtra up 60% of the death was in the age group below 60 years so even for patient doctors of less than 40 years the death rate was 21% in india documented so we all need to be careful because somewhere something went wrong in the policy of individual protection or the hospital giving me a protection or the government trying to give us a protection somewhere something went wrong and i just wanted to impress on these two papers before we go ahead and discuss on a few important points what dr sanjay had already lucidly elaborated like we all are doing opds in various setups in the country now the important issue is do we all need to put on a n95 mask or a simple surgical mask if we are doing a routine opd and what is the protocol i think uh, when you are in a epidemic or a pandemic and if your okay. uh, the cases are rising in your uh, area then i think okay. n95 mask is absolutely necessary uh, that's the that's the message we should uh, try to convey to every physician Correct. that yes we are using a n95 now would you sit on a ac chamber or would you like to uh, switch off no. your ac no no ac chamber all the doors should be open and frequent good ventilation should be there wonderful that's the another second point important point and what about uh, do you keep hand washing or using a sanitizer at your chamber clinic when yes. you are sitting and seeing patient uh, examination gloves for every patient after every patient leaves even you are the the front that the, the table which you are the all the x rays or you know, notes are put i think your attendant should clean with sodium hypochlorite or wirex okay. solution and whether you should put on a pair of gloves always while uh, even uh, attending a clinic or even while touching your patient yes always means absolutely always. no compromise in so fact dr saha that is a very good thing which you have said Uh, i know certain of my colleagues which they insisted that the hospital should provide these facilities should curtail the number of opd patients in two yes. hours you know because it is physically impossible to see more than 10 to 12 patients in two yes. hours and they put their foot down saying that if you don't this is bare minimum it is non negotiable and if the hospital is not ready to provide it that's it we will not come to the hospital full stop so so we can boil down to dr sanjay the we boil down to n95 is mandatory 
use a very good ventilated room and if you want you can switch off your ac hand Correct. washing cleaning and gloves if you are touching the patient Correct. if you are not touching the patient probably you might as well not escape also but you can continue uh, hand uh, washing and maintain a distance of 6 feet and what about how long would you yeah. continue wearing this n95 mask my n95 mask is clean white chaga chak no, how long should i, I think, continue i think every day one new mask should be there i know there are certain recommendations from aims they give five masks to the doctors and they say that if you use that mask on monday probably you can use the same mask after five days but i think uh, yes, nowadays n95 40 yeah n95 mask at least in mumbai now we are getting at 90 rupees and i think our life is much more precious than 90 rupees you know so but yes uh, if we if we look at india as a whole then probably the statistics will stay that we can use the n95 for 40 hours so if you are working about 6 to 8 hours in a day you can still continue it for 5 hours unless and until your mask is soiled correct or take five masks use yeah. number one mask on monday number two on tuesday number three and again come back to number five after five days so by another that important time, question which uh, dr sanjay we should discuss is whether we should use a wear, uh, the mask with a vent or not it should not yes that's another it important point we have touched and uh, let's yeah. go to the theater sir yeah i have a yeah. question regarding n95 mask yes uh, so there were there are multiple different types of n95 mask available there are many ones which are written n95 but there, but there is no n i o s h no n i o s h no ffp2 so there are these mask where the it ends here there is a rubber yes. band which ends at the ear and there are these magnum and venus mask which have a rubber band here and here So okay. recently, I read somewhere that basically you should not re not use these masks which end here at the ear. You should have a mask which ends here and here, the big rubber band. So the N95 mask comes with two straps. Now, yeah. what we need to understand: this is a heavy virus, hmm. so you need to put it under your chin and hmm. pull the strap on the top, hmm. and the upper strap goes down. That's the most important thing while putting on a N95 mask. and about the companies what you talked about yes 3m was not able to give it that uh, uh, easily to all the places i don't know about availability in other places but in calcutta we initially had a bit of difficulty but now we are getting it pretty cheap 80 rupees or so or 85 rupees or no no my query was that there are these two three types of n95 mask which are available i'll just show you one which i am basically now getting i'll just show you okay so so there is this one uh, let me share my screen so you'll have a better uh, because it is basically not recommended i'll just tell you why also so so there is this mask you see this this is a this uh, is a mini yeah. n95 i'm getting this for 35 rupees <laughs> see next 60 means mrp is 60 and i'm getting it for even one dealer is ready to sell me so what happened is that the dealer who is selling me he himself is also a general surgeon Okay. So that I asked him, "What do you wear?" Well, this is for the staff. I wear Magnum. So, well, okay, then Magnum. send me Magnum only. <laughs> okay. So the Magnum is double the cost of this. So this is sixty rupees, as you can see here. So and so this is not rubber band, which doesn't go over your head. It just it, it attaches doesn't go. to the back of the ear. So these are yeah. not recommended. These are Probably definitely these are not recommended. The one which goes behind your head is what is uh, yes. more important. And But about companies, yeah. it's very difficult to tell you, uh, Neeraj, like whether uh, which company we should take. But yes. if you standardize, like I don't think 3M is available everywhere. Yes, uh, I don't know. Then these uh, are the ones. This is though it is written N I O S H. I don't think this is recommended. I'm not so sure. Again, very difficult to answer this question on any yes. forum. Like which one is yes, which one is no. Not the company. Uh, I'm just talking about. See, this is yeah. written NIOS. This is written FFP2. But this is yes. went. I don't think the CDC is not recommending these anymore. CDC Absolutely, Niraj. Yes. I think uh, this is not recommended. Hmm. Okay. I think you should get your hands, if possible, on 3M or Honeywell, like standard manufacturers. Yes. You know. Hmm. Oh yeah, Niraj. 3M. Yeah, sab jagah mein I don't think is easily available. It's yeah, yeah. Beam is not available. Uh, so have we discussed about this one? Venus. Yes, yes, we were. Uh, I was about to. I've got a question on that also. This uh, this is a well ventilated mask which we should use, hmm. and hmm. Uh, it's now available. Hmm. Uh, Venus company be banana, and there is another company. Uh, where are you getting it from? 
This is to Venus. This is Venus. See, there Venus. is a quotation also of Venus here. It is eleven thousand rupee. Venus का इसका सस्ता वाला version भी एक है. एक there is a सस्ता version that is three M three M six two zero zero. हाँ six two zero. Let me show you that also. So I have everything stored in my WhatsApp now. <laughs> So this is the real 3M mask, the N95 yes. which I, we were talking about. FFP2, FFP2. This is the real model of 3M. Real so model. Like and that, what you were talking about was this, I think. I recently bought this. That's why I have it stored here. So this is the one with the filter here. Yeah, 3M, correct. Mm, 3M. This is very cheap. This is only three thousand rupees with filter, and you change the filter once a month. You get about three or four filters along with it. Yeah. No, no, you get only one pair. इसके सर थ्री थाउजेंड रुपीज में वन पेर ही मिलता है या डॉक्टर बिजला नहीं द रिकमेंडेशन फॉर दिस दिस इज वेरी गुड वी आर यूजिंग इट फोर्टी आवर्स यू कैन यूज एक्चुअली एंड आइडियली आफ्टर फोर्टी आवर्स यू शुड चेंज द फिल्टर राइट सो दिस इज नाइन हंड्रेड रुपीज नाइन हंड्रेड रुपीज दिस फिल्टर पेर वन पेर फॉर नाइन हंड्रेड रुपीज करेक्ट दिस इज आई एम यूजिंग राइट नाउ that is okay. correct and that is i think all the orthopedic surgeon should be using because as you have said this is quite uh, quite affordable and it yes. lasts for almost 40 hours yeah there is one after disadvantage is one disadvantage with this uh, this type of uh, gear is if you sweat yes sweat droplet it comes down it drops on your shield it drops on your shield, shield and it goes down and goes correct. down and if you are in the uh, leaning over a operating zone you might get yes. Uh, that's the only problem the longer so i feel that longer surgeries this is not recommended that is what i feel yeah the longer surgery is this one longer yeah. surgery i think we should be using this one this one venus yeah this correct. one normal wala ha huh? correct mm. yeah because this seals everything inside mm -hmm. and i think since we are on this topic mm. i sort of uh, skipped one point i think the international recommendations are also as uh, dr saha was actually discussing that we should not be working in close contact with the patients for more than 4 hours per 24 hours hmm. yes because it is not the the exposure but the the type of exposure and the amount of viral load to which we are exposed hmm. suppose now in we, mumbai uh, all the hospitals we, 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 are covid we, we, hospitals yes uh, dr sanjay i will be touching on that points also we will be discussing slowly uh, yeah. then we going into the theater Like you talked about two RT PCR tests to be done in a span of forty-eight to seventy-two hours. Yeah, two RT PCR. That means for uh, a COVID first... positive patient, for yes. COVID negative patient, if it is negative and CT is negative, you can take the patient fracture patient to the theater straight away. But we in Mumbai, there was a time where almost fifty percent of our trauma patients were COVID positive. So and then we, we have to be wait. discussing about this dilemma situation as Neeraj is also there. now that you have a scenario where your pcr rt pcr is negative okay. when your rt pcr is negative there is 30% chance that the patient might be positive correct would you do go go in for doing an antibody test to find out whether it's a g type or an m type or wait or you take that okay mera positive negative hai to main ja ke operate karu that's an i would do a case. ct We If your CT is coming CD. negative, we accept the fact that ninety-five percent okay. Uh, you are probably uh, the patient doesn't have it. Correct. But uh, is there a recommendation that we should do an antibody test? As because that is also available cheaper. Yeah. Whatever papers I have read, I have not come across the recommendation. But again, I think as you know, the topic is quite fluid, and every day new evidence is coming. And now the antibody testing is also freely available in our country. so uh, i don't know means do you know any paper or anything which it's not about the paper it's about the interpretation to the igg and the igm igm levels. correct if you haven't done the if your rt pcr is negative and your igm level is positive, is positive then you have to insist the patient to have his rt pcr tested again okay correct this might be a positive case and yeah. probably you might get it from him so uh, the, the one important point which i wanted to impress is positive we will not operate okay fine we will not go going to operate a positive but never be sure that negative ko mai sub negative ko operate karu even if his rt uh, uh, hrct is negative hrct negative pcr negative i think we should do an igm to reconfirm that kuch bhi hai ki nahi if igm is positive Beware of that patient Wait. and do a RT PCR again. 
I will tell you one of my experiences. We are going to discuss this tomorrow morning. One of the papers also we are going to discuss this. So two yesterday, two days back, two days back, I operated a patient. She basically went to a hospital with a gangrene to another hospital, a government hospital. They went to okay. with a gangrene. It was a great toe gangrene, dry gangrene, and she eventually was diagnosed as COVID. That was almost six weeks back, and then she was there for two weeks, and there were two RT PCR negative. And okay. then after that, she was discharged. She was at home. They were trying to manage because no hospital was ready to take her. So after six weeks of negative testing, she came back to me, and I tested her for antibodies. Antibodies were negative, but she had medical comorbidities. Her liver was not functioning properly. Her SpO2 was a little low, and uh, like kept keeping a little low. There was a little bit of tachycardia. There was some renal liver function derangement. But there was no option. I had to operate the gangrene. I took all the precautions. I waited for two days. I did all the tests. I operated the gangrene. Did a Lisfranc frank amputation. I did a Lisfranc frank amputation. Within two hours, her ammonia shot up. Electrolyte imbalance. Sugar went down. Eventually, she succumbed at night. After less than twenty-four hours of surgery. So I feel that even a patient once has become COVID positive, and even if they are negative now, they still be, are, should be considered as the same mortality as a COVID patient. So mortality is still high. See, Neeraj, the another issue is you talked about a scenario where your RT PCR was negative, two times. Your two times. So, first, it the was positive. First, it was positive. Okay. She had respiratory okay. issues. She was admitted okay. to hospital. That was in the month of June. I am talking about the beginning of June. Okay. Then, yeah, then she got two times RT PCR negative. She got discharged after two weeks. Then went home, sat at home for two weeks over the gangrene. Then came to me. Finally, the relatives thought that this is gangrene is increasing. Now we should bring it to the doctor. Then they came to a private hospital, my nursing home, and with due diligence, I did all the investigations, whatever were even a CT angiography and everything. But eventually, she died. The physician showed me an X-ray, which oh. is suggestive of coronary syndrome post-operative or a pulmonary embolism. One of the two things. And it was sort of Lisfranc frank amputation, which is basically cut to cut. There was no bone cut. It was a Lisfranc frank amputation. And wound was closed. There was no bleeding. There was hardly any bleeding. There was uh, half an hour, forty-five minutes was the surgical time, skin to skin. The spinal anesthesia was given was two mL. The spinal anesthesia wore off in a span of two hours. In spite of that, the patient died. Doctor Bijaladi, you are absolutely correct. Actually, the cause of death once the COVID patient is there, even if they become negative, nowadays that's why the even our physician colleagues are now using D-dimers and other tests and our cheaper yes. CRP. And you are absolutely right. In America, also the CDC has showed. Good sir. Good. Hi, Doctor Ashok. Doctor Ashok. Ashok, you can come to order. Change your name. Okay. Actually, sir, Shamshul is admitted with COVID. His whole yes. family. We know. We know. Please, brother. Hi, Ram. Hi, sir. How are you? Hi. Other Shamshul better. Yeah, Shamshul is better now. Sir, you are in Pondicherry or in Bangalore, sir? Doctor Raj Gopalan. Hmm. Sir, he is in Pondicherry. Sir, you are in Pondi or Bangalore? 